My name's Carlo, and I work for WIP. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces here from our events over the years, which is always great to see. So the way that we do things, um, we don't tend to be especially formal. We want to make this interesting and, and fun for you guys. Guys, come on up. On our first set, we've got, uh, we've got four guys that are going to talk about hardware development. Go ahead, take a seat. Get yourself situated. That are going to talk about hardware development, IoT, and wearables, and, and that sort of thing. So I also just want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. They're the, the people that, that make this event possible. So I'd encourage you to, uh, to go along and, and check out their demos and, and talk with them. Mimis and, and her team from, from MediaTek are over here by the, the bottling machine. Um, they've got some t-shirts to give away. We'll do some raffling at the end. And then uh, Mimis and her team are also giving away some of their Linkit boards. So be sure and visit them to, to find out how you can win one of those. We'll jump into to the, the first discussion here. Um, and we, we, we're calling this event a developer smackdown. Let's talk hardware. On the far side here, we have Robert Kay, who uh, is currently with the MetaBrains Foundation. Um, but has previously worked on a, a pretty interesting project. You can see on his shirt, Robot Made Cocktails and the Bartendro. Um, next to him is our first Mark from Oasis, uh, and then our second Mark from the things.io, Barcelona, IoT, and, and several other things he can tell you about. And then finally in here, Emanuele from Superclock. Um, so guys, if you could just tell us a little bit about what you do, your background in, in hardware, IoT, that sort of thing, that would be great. So, Robert, take, take it away. My, uh, my day job running Music Brains and so forth, which is uh, what my official affiliation is, has nothing to do with this. But uh, my side project is working on a company called Party Robotics. And we make Bartendro, which is a cocktail mixing robot. So what we've done is we spent about three years trying to figure out how to build a machine that makes cocktails. And surprisingly, this was actually a difficult kind of task. And uh, along the way, we got you know, drunk a lot of times and spent a lot of money trying to build a decent cocktail robot. But in the end, we finally got something that was worth it, that worked. And uh, we did a lot of work to figure out exactly how to build a Kickstarter around it. And uh, then we launched a Kickstarter in early 2013. And we were asking for $130,000, uh, $135,000 to get our minimum order for our pumps in. And uh, we actually reached a goal of, and we got about $197,000. Um, then over the next uh, four months, we delivered about 300 cocktail robots uh, to pretty much all corners of the world. And uh, by Kickstarter standards, we were one month late, which is, by, so by Kickstarter standards, that's about two months early. I'm Mark, I'm a telecommunications engineer. I'm the CTO of Oasis, but at night and in secret, I build stuff like sensors for Arduino, uh, things for the Raspberry Pi, little robots, and stuff like that. Hi, I'm, I'm the second Mark. I'm the tallest Mark, actually. Tall Mark, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm, I have been on the Internet of Things the last 10 years, actually, connecting things when Arduino was even not existing. And um, I, have been, I have done a lot of projects for the companies where I work, but also on my free time, from connecting sofas to the Internet that were vibing at the, at the vibe of a DJ, for example, at the Sonar Festival here in Barcelona. I have been, during three years, connecting beers to the Internet at the Oktoberfest in Munich. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Emanuele, and when I was living in London, I had a problem that I was always late in the morning to get my bus. So I moved to Berlin and I started building a clock that shows you the next uh, connection from your home. And then it, it started growing and growing, and now we are actually trying to make it like a real product. So I'm a software engineer myself, I started building hardware in the last year, and yeah, that's mostly it. Thank you. Primarily, I'm a software guy, but uh, I've got a lot of experience building uh, mm -hmm. architectures. So when we built a cocktail mm -hmm. robot, um, I was the guy that actually designed the architecture and uh, the flow of the communication inside of the bot. Um, and one of the things that we realized early on was in order to reduce the cost of the bot, we needed to reduce the amount of cabling in the bot, because cabling ended up being one of the more expensive things. And if you have 15 pumps, you need to have 15 cables to hook them up. 
and that cost got really uh, expensive very fast. So we opted to actually put an Arduino into every single pump, and therefore just and reduce the amount of cabling required inside of the bot, but that made the communication inside the bot significantly more complex. So I designed the architecture for how to actually build this and then uh, came up with the original schematics for how this should work and then my uh, business partner at the time actually went and uh, laid out the boards and we had them shipped out to China and brought them back and uh, built a robot and got 150 of our friends drunk. <laughs> so, so maybe Emmanuel, you can tell us a little bit then how uh, you, you talked to, uh, to us about the, the problem that you were trying to solve, which was being late for your bus. Um, how did you get started with hardware? I mean, what, what were, you know, having a background in software and then what were some of the first steps you took and, and I guess what would you share that you learned from that journey? Okay, for me it was uh, quite straightforward, let's say. To, okay, I know, I know coding, I know programming, and I know there are a lot of platforms like, for example, Arduino, where I can easily like, write a few lines of code connect to an API, I, I know web programming, so it was quite straightforward for me to just start this. Mm -hmm. And I mean, since I like to think with objects and circuitry since, since a lot of years, it was just for me like a natural, uh, natural solution. I just had a problem and I tried to solve it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, then I started having a little bit more difficulties when I, uh, when I when I said okay now we we're gonna build a product and for me programming for hardware is way different from web programming because you don't have the same resources you don't have the garbage collector when you program an Arduino <laughs> and so the the approach uh, really changed a lot especially in debugging for example and and this kind of task that it's it's not the same as as a web application. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think it's, it's something that you can easily learn. What about adding connectivity into the mix? Because that seems like something that still can, can cause some difficulties, you know, networking, whether it's, you know, it's over Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, the mobile networks, those sorts of things. Um, how is that changing and, and maturing? Well, it's getting easier and easier. So right now you have a breakboard, maybe the NLF 8001. It's a Bluetooth chip. You connect it. You connect it over the SPI, and then you have the all the Bluetooth stack and the 4.0 stack. You program it as easy as you program, for example, Android uh, Bluetooth stack for Android, and then it's plug and play. It works. And actually, we are going to see uh, very soon, probably in the next year, a lot of low range protocols working on this kind of prototyping tools like Zigbee, Six Low Pan, Bluetooth Low Energy, like working super easier like today with Wi-Fi with most of, the, mm -hmm. of these modules. But then another thing that is important is that we need to think about internet like electricity. No? So we, we came here at the Moritz Brewery and we didn't think that. They, and do they have electricity? Of course they have. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the same with the internet. So in the next year, so of course, it's supposed that everything will be, so there will be internet, oops. Uh, there will be internet everywhere, and, and yeah, we have to have this requirement in mind. Emmanuel, I'd like to come back to the, the point that you made about commercializing your products and how that remains really hard. Um, tell us a little bit about about what you're doing with Superclock and, and how you're trying to, to go from, you know, from being a software developer, as you say, to selling this commercial product in the market, a piece of hardware. Okay, for us right now, the biggest challenge <laughs> <laughs> is the actual business model because we are, in terms of things, it's kind of a new uh, field. So there are not so many... Uh, business model that has been validated. So we we are facing basically a, a two-phase choice. We have to either put a lot of effort in building hardware, so make money from the hardware we produce, or either sell very cheap hardware and make money from the data mining of the data that we're going to make uh, from the user using our product. Mm -hmm. And that's something that it's it's still, we're still trying to figure out how to, yeah. how to yeah. do this. Because, yeah. yeah, we don't want to be evil, but we still don't want <laughs> to make money. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a big challenge. 
Uh, right now, um, I think we're gonna, uh, our next step, we're gonna do like a, uh, like a month of testing with real users and then we will probably try to validate it with a uh, crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes. But it's, it's a very tough challenge at the moment. Uh, where do you have your hardware manufactured? Is it still small scale? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Me, well, uh, we have a, a company here in Spain uh, in the País Basque. It's called Iker, and it has a, factor, a manufacturer in China and in Mexico, and it does the production for us. Okay. How did you get connected with them, or how did you find them? Or? Good question. Um, <laughs> Is it the secret? Or, well, it's uh, because of our investors. Okay. That makes it a little easier. It's a partnership. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we also have um, uh, a small company, a small startup here that's helping us with all this hardware design and all these things. Like what I was saying before, um, moving forward to Arduino to a real design, it's a step you should do. You should really do, and you should do it with carefully. Because it's, it would say, well, it's easy to put the same chip in the different PCB and then connect all this stuff in the same PCB, but it usually doesn't work. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that's another interesting point where, you know, again, sort of bridging this divide from I've got this, sort of like Robert said, I've got this great thing and it's fantastic and it works. You spend the money on the investment and it comes back and it doesn't work. Um, so could you talk a little bit maybe about how you guys dealt with that and... and and handle that? Well, the reason why it usually doesn't work is because you, you do all this making thing with Arduino and all the words with long cables, with jumper cables and all stuff, and you're not taking into account all the emissions emerging from the board. Yeah, and that's an issue. And the thing is, when you put all these things close together into a PCB, there's a lot of um, interference between the components that you didn't expect. So you need to go to a non-echoic chamber, test, it, test this board for the, em the electromagnetic emissions, then give it back, correct the thing, print it again, and what he's saying, uh, if a board costs you $100, you're going to throw away $100 each iteration. It's mm -hmm. not like software. You need to take it very carefully. What are some of the really interesting things that, that you guys are seeing in this IoT and wearable space, you know, not necessarily coming from commercial companies, but more from individuals like yourselves that sort of have started with an idea and then are on that path to commercialism. So that could be interesting devices you've seen, interesting wearables, interesting software and services too. Well, I'll go back to my Raspberry Pi A plus example, uh, which is cheap and consumes no power. The form factor is still a little bit big, but the bottom line is for 120 milliamps and uh, 20 euros or so, I have a device that's internet enabled and uh, has computing power and I can download a bunch of packages on it. Like, for me, that's a game changer. Like, everything is going to have, an, has, have a Raspberry Pi. Previously, everything had an Arduino but now everything's gonna have a Raspberry Pi. So maybe the form factor of the Raspberry Pi isn't quite there yet, but people are developing all kinds of single board computers, and I don't need as much power as there is in the Raspberry Pi A. Make it a little bit less powerful, a little bit more compact, and uh, that is gonna be a game changer. Um, especially if it can run on a battery um, for several hours. I think that's gonna be a game changer and uh, I think for the wearables really to actually take off, we're gonna need to see a drastic improvement in battery capacity, mm -hmm. which I'm not hopeful on just yet. Kickstarter and, and Indiegogo and that sort of thing has, has come up a few times here. Um, you know, and, and that seems to be really the, the main way that a lot of companies are trying to take these, these hardware products that they're creating to market. Um, can you share some of your experience with that and how it's gone? Any tips? And how do you look past that for other? Uh, we for other... haven't done a Kickstarter campaign yet. We are starting ah, preparing okay. it. Okay. And yeah, it's gonna it's gonna take a lot of time because usually, I mean, I had a lot of friends and colleagues uh, that have done a Kickstarter campaign, and they just say that. Okay, when you decide to start a Kickstarter campaign, you just have to stop doing anything else in your mm -hmm. life. Yeah. Because you have to just prepare the marketing plan and push everyone, contact the press. And it's a, it's a full-time job just to do the Kickstarter campaign. And sometimes it doesn't go very well anyway. 
Well, I think that's about all that we have time for. So let's give a hand to our panelists. Thank you very much, guys. That was fantastic. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Uh, you are all excused. Um, and then if we could get our sponsors to come on up. No? <laughs> uh, thank you very much, guys. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mimis Clearan. I'm responsible for MediaTek Labs um, in Europe and India. Uh, MediaTek is a uh, fabulous semiconductor company. We design systems on chip that go into various consumer electronics devices. As an example, we're in uh, about one third of the world's Android devices. Uh, we're leading in the home entertainment segment in the smart TVs, uh, set-top boxes, Blu-ray, stuff like that. Uh, also, uh, the biggest chips that provided for feature phones, we're in wireless charging solutions, etc. MediaTek Labs was uh, launched in September last year. It's part of MediaTek's initiative to become more of an open and global company. We want to engage with developers and startup companies to create new types of devices based around MediaTek chipsets. So, uh, the reason we're here today is because we'd like you to use our developer platforms. So we have something called MediaTek Linkit, which is a portfolio of platforms for wearables and IoT. We're raffling a couple of our hard, uh, you know, hardware kits at the back, so go uh, check them out later. Um, one of the platforms is called MediaTek Linkit 1. Uh, it's optimized for wearables and IoT solutions based on uh, the world's smallest system on chip for wearables. Tiny footprint, smaller than my, uh, my pinky nail. Um, and also very power efficient. That's one of MediaTek's strengths. Uh, on this dev board, it pre-integrates three chipsets actually from MediaTek that supports both GSM, GPRS, Bluetooth, um, Wi-Fi, and also the, the big satellite uh, positioning technologies. So uh, GPS, uh, GLONASS, and uh, Beidou. It comes with the software development kit, all available for download on MediaTek Labs portal. We have another uh, platform called MediaTek Linkit Connect 7681, which is based on MediaTek's, uh, one of MediaTek's Wi-Fi chipsets. This is really meant to enable quick um, uh, Wi-Fi enablement of IoT devices that go into your smart home or smart office. So you can build things like smart plugs, uh, light, smart connected light bulbs, um, and things like that to remotely control your home, basically. These are available for sale through one of our hardware partners called Seed Studio, um, so go check them out. But to accompany these platforms, we also realize that IoT and wearable developers, they need to store and access the data somewhere. This week at Mobile World Congress, we launched MediaTek Cloud Sandbox, which is a type of, of IoT data platform and playground for developers to uh, store and display and remotely access and collaborate around the data that their IoT devices are creating. In addition, you talked about the pain point earlier of how do you actually commercialize products. So uh, we this week launched MediaTek Labs Partner Connect, which is a matchmaking program and, uh, to help developers in a you know, long tail to uh, be connected with supply chain partners that are already licensed to use MediaTek uh, systems on chip. I'd really strongly encourage you to visit labs.mediatek.com, register. Uh, I'm really, really keen to hear feedback from the developer community. This is still the early days for MediaTek to work with developers. Get started, give us feedback, and we're happy to help connect you with the ODMs and manufacturing partners and distributors of MediaTek chipsets. Thanks a lot. All right. All right. Thank you, Minutes and MediaTek.